But today I'm talking to uh, Roxanne Longstreet Conrad, who's also known as Rachel Kane. Thank you for talking to Dark Matter. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Um, you have a varied career, starting with a degree in business administration and even working as a professional musician. Yes. I, I Apparently I, I can't decide what I want to do. Um, but I started out thinking that I was going to be a professional musician and I studied very hard for many years and uh, my mother always told me you have to have a day job <laughs> that's not a very stable life and she was probably right so I went to school and got an accounting degree because it started with A <laughs> no better reason than that I did not have a passion for accounting I don't know that there is any such thing but I, uh, uh, the, so I, I just decided I would do that for a while and then um, the writing thing was just a hobby. I didn't think it would ever go anywhere, really. Well, I think it has, surprisingly. It's true. Um, your, your mother's a very sensible woman, though, with, with the whole day job thing. I might have taken it too far. Yeah? Because I didn't quit my day job until three years ago, uh, which was while I was already doing four books a year <laughs> and still doing a 60 hour a week job. So that might have been a little much, perhaps. You, you know, the word workaholic springs to mind? Yeah. Crazy person, workaholic. Yeah. It, it all describes me pretty well. How did you manage writing with the day job? Uh, I discovered that the coffee shop near the office opened at 5.30 in the morning. So if I went in at 5.30, it cut my commute to 30 minutes instead of an hour and a half. And then I could get a lot of writing done before 8.30 when I had to be in the office, which was only five minutes away. So I got a lot of good work time in, then I would go and do a full day's work. It was not ideal, <laughs> but it worked fine. So uh, I did that for about probably three years, solid. At which time I realized, yeah, that's a lot of work. Getting up as early is a lot of work. And um, these days you still write in the coffee shop right here, or at least that's what we're keeping in this I do occasionally. I have a very nice little home office now, so I try to use that as much as possible. But, you know, there are days when you have to get out and you have to do errands, you have to mail things out, whatever it is. And, and so I find that, you know, the coffee shop is still very convenient. They make coffee. I drink it. It's a good relationship we have. Yes, and a lot of writers like their coffee. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, I'm traveling with a, a, a lovely lady on this tour, Heidi, who, who uh, actually only drinks tea, and I don't really understand that, <laughs> but uh, I respect it. I do. Yes. Yeah. Um, when you were a musician, you even worked with John Williams. I did, uh, for about five hours. <laughs> <laughs> it was a short relationship, but very intense. Um, he was uh, he was a conductor who, uh, at the time, he came and did a guest conductor spot for a youth symphony that I was part of when I was in high school. And so uh, I, I honestly was overwhelmed, and I don't remember much about it, except I was terrified that he might look at me um, and ask me something. But uh, it was it was a great, you know, looking back on it, a great experience. Um, I was older and less panicked when Henry Mancini was the conductor, um, except that my first chair professor decided to play a trick on me and not and show up without his instruments uh, for Baby Elephant Walk when Henry Mancini was conducting, and he said, so you have to play it. And you've never played it before, so you're sight reading it and playing it for Henry Mancini. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> that was how I learned to play that, was hardcore. What's your instrument? Clarinet. That's challenging. Yeah, it's it's the, probably the single most recognizable clarinet riff you can do, other than maybe Rhapsody in Blue, which I also did, but not for Henry Mancini. So how did you make the transition from professional musician to writer? Uh, I was doing both for a little while, and I sold my first book. I was actually in the Dallas Wind Symphony at the time, which was uh, a pretty big deal. And um, I realized that I only had so many hours in the day. I was still working full time, and I had this 
extensive hobby of you know being a musician and then I wanted to write on top of it I couldn't do all of that so I finally just said which do I really really want to do the music was great I loved it but I loved this writing thing just as much or more and I decided that sounded like something I wanted to try so I went after it so any regrets periodically I will feel I'll go to the symphony and I'll think it sounds so much better on stage <laughs> than it does in the audience. <laughs> you just get a very different sound to an orchestra, but uh, but no, I, I think I made the right choice. I was never going to be a star in this in the symphony, you know. And clarinets they don't really don't really have clarinet stars, so it's not like violinists. But uh, I, I think uh, I think I made the right choice. I, I'm happy with what I did and what I'm doing. Um, and you, in 2010, you um, quit your job. You mentioned that before. Mm -hmm. How has the lifestyle changed your writing? I guess the biggest change would be the travel. Because when you're working a day job, you have to sort of fit the travel in whenever you can get time off from work. So it's a very short burst of, you know, maybe you get two weeks off at the most in the US and so you're saying okay I'm gonna go to do a two-week tour and it has to all fit in there um, when you're not doing that you get to do a lot more shows th where they invite you in um, I've done this last year I've been on the road for almost seven months out of the year which is great and exhausting you know I love travel and I love all of that it's kind of hard to balance the writing with it sometimes but uh, but it's a it's a huge opportunity to really see the world, and that's that's probably the biggest thing. Um, I still get up at five because sadly I trained myself to do that, and it's when I write best, so I don't really get to sleep in. Oh well, there's still coffee. <laughs> yes, the essential ingredient. Um, you you've been writing now for. I think um, you've been published since 1990. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it was 90 or 91, one of the two. So 21, 22 years. Long time, yeah. yeah. And you've had a few pseudonyms in that time. Mm -hmm. I started out as Roxanne Longstreet, which was my name. Uh, and then I got married and I became Roxanne Conrad. Um, Mainly because my five books I did as Roxanne Longstreet perhaps didn't sell as well as one might have hoped, or at all. So, uh, so I became Roxanne Conrad, did two books under that name, had a similar kind of problem. Mainly because I was trying to write urban fantasy before urban fantasy actually existed. They didn't know what to call it, so I was in the horror section, and then I was in the romantic suspense section and no I didn't fit really in either of those places because what I was doing was very blending of genres so it wasn't until about I took about three years off and I came back with um, the manuscript for Ill, for Ill Wind which was the first Weather Warden book and suddenly uh, a few people had started writing what became known as urban fantasy principally Laurel Hamilton Jim Butcher, so I was able to get in there fairly early with something that fit in that genre finally, <laughs> and I knew what I was doing. You know, that was it. So it, it turned out well, but uh, and that was when I became Rachel Kane. I've also written as Julie Fortune. I wrote a Stargate SG1 novel as Julie Fortune because I just love Stargate for no other reason than that. And. Um, and my first book was reprinted under a different house name in America, and it was so I'm also Ian Hamill for one book. So how did you manage the Ian Hamill? I, I didn't. They they said we want to republish this book, but we want it to be part of a series which is already under a house name of Ian Hamill. Can we pay you more to be Ian Hamill for a book? Yes, you can. That's the correct answer. Yes, you can. <laughs> okay. Um. With the, the Stargate book, um, what was it like writing in someone else's sandbox? I love writing in someone else's sandbox. I, there's a lot of uh, 
a lot of challenge to it in that you're maybe working with characters you didn't create, but media tie-ins, they've already done a lot of the work for you. You've got rules, you have a universe, you have characters, the characters have traits. And very helpfully, they've supplied actors, so you know what they look like, <laughs> you know what kind of speech patterns they have. Um, so if you're paying attention to what's going on on screen, I think it's it's a pretty easy gig in many ways. But I, I loved it just because I'd had all these story ideas for Stargate that nobody else was doing, and I said, now I get to do them. No one can tell me no. Well, no, MGM could have, but they didn't, so that was all right. Would you do it again? Um, would I do it again? I don't know that there's any show I'm particularly passionate enough about right now to be able to internalize the characters that way. Uh, I could probably do it, but I don't feel moved to do it right now. And Lord knows I have enough already on my plate. <laughs> <laughs> six months a year, writing four books a year. Yes, I would imagine so. Yeah, it's it's actually five books this year. Oh, I can. Yeah. Because <laughs> because I like to take it up at difficult difficulty level whenever I can. So uh, uh, that's that's this year. Next year I'm going to try to take a vacation. Ha. Huh. Vacation. Mm. I'm not sure what that is. Yeah. <laughs> I hear it's nice. You've written a number of series. Would, would you like to tell us about them and, and what are the, some of the similarities and differences between the series? Sure. Um, the Morganville Vampire series, which is probably what I'm best known for, is a young adult series. Uh, it, it, it's a vampire series, but the vampires are sort of a cross between the mafia and a tiger preserve. <laughs> they live in their own town that they have built and control, and every they control everyone in it. and. Uh, everything is built for their comfort and their security so humans fit into this awkwardly if at all and my main character Claire comes to this town as a university student and discovers all of these secrets about the town and they can't leave so now she's trapped into this and she has to learn to work with the vampires and figure out how to live in this town that certainly isn't human friendly a lot of the time and that's uh, that's that's going to, well, right now we have 13 books out. Bitter Blood is number 13. There's going to be a 14 and 15 coming out next year. So, and then I'm going to hit the pause button and take a vacation. Uh, the other series, the Weather Warden series, is complete at nine books. It's a story of a woman who's part of an organization that controls the weather. And they use genies to do it. Um, like most organizations, they are entirely dysfunctional. Uh, so, hence you can see the whole, you know, fiasco of the weather <laughs> around the world. Um, Outcast Season is a spin-off series of that, uh, which features a genie that has become human and doesn't like it a bit and wants to be a genie again. But sadly, her only path to doing that is probably killing the human race. So, we shall see what she decides. That's four books. And then there's uh, there's the Revivalist series, which is what I'm working on now in adult. And it's well, the first book is called Working Stiff, and it's a funeral director who discovers her bosses are reviving the dead for profit in the basement. And with the help of a military-grade pharmaceutical drug, it doesn't go well, this discovery. Uh, so pretty soon she is also uh, dependent upon the daily shots to keep her stable if not alive. So it's a little bit of a zombie, a little bit of military, thriller, suspense, spy novel, all of that stuff mixed in together. So you really do like crossing the genres? I love it. I like I like just trying to th throw as much as I can into the mix and see what happens. It's great fun. Um, you've also written non-fiction essays. Mm -hmm. I started writing the non-fiction essays um, the, there was a publisher called Smart Pop out of Dallas that was doing a book on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And that's how I got started, was they said, oh, you write vampire books, you can do us an essay about Buffy. I said, sure, I can do that. I forgot. I don't remember how to write nonfiction. So out of desperation, when the deadline loomed, I decided I would do a fictional thesis by a demon 
mathematically proving who was the most powerful force for good in Sunnydale. And it came out very funny. And uh, they said, this is great. Now you're the funny person. So 17 essays later, I was all out of funny because we, we were out of shows. Uh, we were into shows like NYPD Blue. It's hard to be funny about NYPD Blue. Uh, and, and I think the last one I did, I, I did Mapping the World of Harry Potter, which was fun. And then um, I think I, have, I, I actually did Immortal Instruments uh, Smart Pop recently where I talked about the history of tattoos. But uh, yeah, I, I don't do them as much anymore because they are quite challenging. <laughs> Especially when they say, but it's not, you're, you didn't turn into a funny one. You have to be funny. So. Uh, are these available in a collection? Um, they're not available in, a, in a, just, just a, a collection, just of mine. But they, all of the Smart Pop books are available from, I think it's smart pop, pop, smartpopbooks.com. Um, and it's out of Dallas. They do some great stuff. I think they have close to 50 uh, smart pop culture books out there now and um, for a while there I was in the running with Lawrence Watt Evans to see who could do the most articles but he's long since passed me so <laughs> I just don't rate anymore. <laughs> well it sounds like they're, they'd be um, always following up on. Um, I have to confess that a lot of the coming questions are um, thanks to Denise Perko, okay. who is a huge fan of yours. <laughs> um, the very next question though is by Evie Kendall, who asks about the power balance between the love interests in your novels. Oh, now specifically in Morganville or just generally in all of them? Uh, typically, <laughs> I tend to write all kinds of different relationships and generally the women are quite strong. Um, generally the men are quite strong, but and sometimes they're supernatural, and sometimes they're not. Sometimes they're just uh, great. <laughs> they're fun to work with. Um, sometimes they're crazy. I, I don't know that I have it one way I do it. Um, I try to make them as healthy and interesting as I can because almost always they are long-term relationships. I don't believe in a lot of relationship drama. My drama happens outside of the relationship. The relationship is where you go for comfort. Um, so it's a bit of a different thing than perhaps a, a, a series that would focus only on the relationship, breakup, makeup kind of thing. Um, mine almost always ends happily in some way. Maybe not in each book, because I do tend to throw in terrible cliffhangers and oh, evil. things like that. Yeah, sorry about that. But it's fun for me. <laughs> it is. Um, what's the difference between writing young adult and adult novels? And how do you decide what audience you're writing for? I think typically as a writer, you don't really decide the audience. You, you're, what you're writing is going to speak to a certain audience but your story has to be organic in itself. I don't find it's a big difference between writing young adult and adult because the characters themselves are the age that derives that. Um, when I'm writing a 16, 17 year old they live in a different world than a 30 year old who has a job and a boyfriend and you know a fast car and you know my teens don't have those things so their world is very different. Uh, I don't think it's a deliberate, I'm going to talk to teens like this. The voice of your character is that way because that's a teen character. Um, and I think approaching it from the opposite end can be really, uh, people can tell. Uh, if you're trying to force it to be a teen book, people can tell. So that's, that's kind of how I approach it. Um, I don't think that one is any harder or easier than the other particularly. It gets easier over time because you know your characters better, your world better, you can do more with it. But um, the writing is the writing, I hope. <laughs> um, other than the Morganville vampires, you've mostly stayed away from the typically done supernatural species and tropes. Mm -hmm. Was that a conscious decision? I don't know that it was a conscious decision at first. I uh, I guess I had 
I had done vampires when I first got started in my early career. And I did it because I liked them. And I still love them. So when I started doing the Weather Warden series, I was thinking, well, these people can control the weather. How do they do that? And I didn't want to make them magicians. I wanted them to be to have some tool that allowed them to do that. And it, just organically, it seemed like a genie appeared. Maybe it was the idea genie, but in any case, sorry, we have rolling carts. So okay. Um, I think that the genie really represented something for me because the genie was a very mythic creature that could do these things, had a lot of power to do them, and also had an intriguing specter of doing it against their will. We don't know how the genies feel about the three wishes. They probably have an opinion. <laughs> what is it? And, and that, it gave me a whole different area to follow. So it wasn't that I set out to do a non-traditional supernatural creature, but it was very intriguing to me because I hadn't seen a lot done with it. And I think that that was, uh, that was something I really liked following. And Revivalist, I thought, I don't want to do zombies, but I want to do something that talks about, well, in my country, health care. And the fact that a lot of us are one month of medication away from, you know, hospitalization. Um, this takes it to the extreme. You're one shot away from decomposition. <laughs> but it's the same kind of thing. Supernatural or not? Um, very tempted to get into the uh, politics, but it might be best to avoid it. <laughs> <laughs> so emotional after the election. Oh, before, after, still, yes, it's a it's a hot button. Um, do you, do you have a love for classic cars and motorcycles? <laughs> because they feature so much in your web in your wooden novel. Yeah, I I think you, you, when I start a character, I pick a few things that I know that that character is gonna like. Yeah. Um, the classic car thing is not really because I liked it, but it was because I had a boyfriend in college who loved classic cars and restored them and tried against my will to teach me about classic cars. <laughs> Some of it must have taken because I, when I started envisioning this character, I really thought about her in this classic Mustang. And, uh, and so that sort of formed my vision of her and what she did in her free time what she liked, you know, fast cars, expensive shoes, <laughs> fun. She was that kind of character. And uh, I, the motorcycle thing came about because my genie informed me in the first chapter of that book that she didn't like cl enclosed spaces. She was claustrophobic, which if you've been a genie and maybe genies get stuck in bottles, might make some sense. So she didn't like to get in the car, she thought that was stupid, so we got her a motorcycle so she could get around. Um, she hates elevators, she'll take the stairs every time. You know, it's, I just thought it was fun to have a supernatural creature with a disability like that. That is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and it makes it so much more relatable as well. It does. I, I just like the fact that she's so all-powerful and she won't get in the elevator. Because it might fall or, you know, she might get stuck. She could probably just lift it up, but, you know, it doesn't matter. Because phobias aren't right. logical. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's great. Um, you recently finished uh, one of the Weather Warden series. Mm -hmm. What was it like to finish a series after being immersed in it for so long? Yeah, that was, a, that was an interesting challenge. Uh, I, I felt like it was time to finish it because... The Weather Warden series is very, very intense. Lots happen. The stakes are always apocalyptic, you know, literally world-destroying, a human race at stake. And after nine books, I thought, I'm not doing it right because the human race is still here and, you know, we're keep to, the evil keeps coming back. So I thought it was probably time to just put a definitive, definitive ending on it. And uh, But, yeah, it was a little sad perhaps to do that and um, at the same time it was really fulfilling because I got to give her the happy ending I couldn't let her have up until book nine. Uh, I'd always planned to give her one 
So it was nice to finally do it. It's, it's lovely. Um, we, with two separate series in the way of the Warden World, do you think you'll ever tell any more stories in that universe? Oh yeah. Uh, I've, I've done a couple of short stories since ending it and I've got probably at least a couple more. I, what we're planning to do is put out probably a, a little collection of Weather Warden stories maybe next year, maybe first part of 2014 because I want to collect some of the other ones that I've done and do a bunch more new ones because I do miss them. You know, I love that universe and I love playing in it and uh, I haven't visited him for a while so I'll just do that because cuz. When, when you use the word visit, is it kind mm -hmm. of like going back and visiting old friends? It is, um, because in my mind, their lives are going on. Mm. It's not It's not like, you know, I've put my toys away. My toys are like Toy Story. <laughs> <laughs> They're having adventures without me, so uh, I can just come and check in on them and say, everything good? Okay, good, you know, do a little story and go away again. <laughs> I love that image. I'm I'm a little crazy. <laughs> it helps to be a writer. Um, Denise Perfect says the idea of being bound to this town in the Morganville series is intriguing, and she's always loved the involvement of ghosts. How did those come about? Because it's not just mm -hmm. another vampire story. Uh, the the ghost, you know, the the town of Morganville. As I started planning it out, I knew it had a lot of layers to it. Uh, on the first layer, there's the vampires. On the second layer, there's why the vampires are uh, are there, which has to do with the fact that they're they're ill and they're they're endangered. <laughs> and then the third level is how then do they protect their town? And part of it is this network of founder houses, which are linked to a central, for want of a better word, computer. And I, as I got to thinking about that, I was thinking about, okay, organic computers. So what do computers do? And one of the things they do is, well, if your computer crashes, it saves the file. If you die in the house, it saves your file. And that's a ghost. Because if, if you're connected to the house and it wants to save you, it can. But it can't necessarily make you human again. It can make you partly there for part of the day. But it can't completely resurrect you. So I thought that was an interesting way to look at ghosts in the same way that you would look at a file. So poor Michael, he's, you know, having, you know, he, he's not, he, when glass houses open, he's probably not in the best situation ever um, because that has got to be pretty bad to be trapped in the house and only really there for half the day. Do these files get corrupted? They can. They can get corrupted. I have not actually, I mean, I had I had some storylines I was going to pursue with it, and I haven't so much just because they haven't come up, but uh, I, we know that the, um, the computer that runs the whole system, uh, perhaps putting a vampire brain in it that might have had a little bit of uh, the disease, the, the kind of the vampire Alzheimer's might not have been the best idea either because that that file definitely got it corrupted <laughs> so yeah it's a it's a kind of a complicated mixture of themes but i really like the fact that it plays out differently than what you would expect a traditional vampire story to be yes yes it sounds very different <laughs> thank you um, your Morgan Mill series has been optioned for film, television, and multimedia by Charles Armitage. Armitage? Armitage, yes. Of Red Dwarf. Yes. Uh, Charles and I worked together for three years on it. Um, unfortunately, with the, the, the there's a little bit of a closed window right now simply because there's so many great vampire things that are successful right now. Um, vampire Diaries is doing great. Uh, True Blood on HBO. We have Twilight dominating at the box office. Um, there's, there's just, there's. I think that the film and television community thinks, well, that's all the vampires, that that's all the vampire fans have room for. You're so kidding. there's a feeling that no one wants to have the 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 ha, ha, set the table with the feast that no one comes to. So they're they're a little worried about vampires being over. 
Um, it's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy because if you don't make more, it's over. <laughs> mm. So we'll see. Um, I, I think it will come back around again. I mean, it does about every five years somebody decides to remake vampire projects. Um, you know, Do- Vampire Diaries did not get made right up out of the box. It was around for quite a while. So I have I have hopes. And sooner or later we'll get something then. Yes. Well, you should get your, your fans writing petitions. I wonder how many oh. of the, um, the internet. <laughs> there are a lot of petitions out there. Unfortunately, we don't know who to send them to. <laughs> well, if Charles has the rights, then maybe him. <laughs> well, Char- poor Charles, you know, he, I, I don't want to get him beat up by fans. He's a nice <laughs> guy, really. <laughs> do, do you think, um, assuming he got the funding and, and mm. everything went ahead, do you, do you think it would have a bit of the Red Dwarf flavor, or would it be very different? Oh, I think it would be very different. Uh, he, the, you know, Charles right now, they're, they've, they've res, resurrected, I guess, Red Dwarf in yes. the UK, and it's doing get great again, so that, uh, that's a really exciting thing. Um, I don't think it's at all the same. I think there would be a very different flavor to it. Um, it might even be more of an American production than a British production, if that were the case. But I don't really know what that would look like. We never really got that far. So, maybe someday. We'll find out. It's in development hell and fingers yeah. crossed. Yeah. Development purgatory, I like to call it. Yes. Fair enough. <laughs> maybe you can earn your way out. <laughs> At the moment, you're, you're here in Melbourne, you're yes. touring Australia. Mm-hmm. What else is on, on the agenda? Uh, we have a signing tonight at uh, Demix, 5.30. And uh, then um, tomorrow, kind of have a free day. A little bit. No, office. office. We're filming at the office. So, and then uh, on, on Friday, we go to Supernova in Adelaide. And we're there Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then Monday... Might have free day. Free yeah, day. could be. Um, hopefully I will be finished with my book by then. <laughs> then it would be an actual free day. But uh, we fly home on Wednesday. And in terms of writing? Mm-hmm. Or in, and in terms of the projects that you have coming out? Yes. What's happening there? Uh, there's still two more books in the Morganville series, 14 and 15. I'm writing 14 right now. It's called Fall of Night. Uh, 15 we just uh, found out is called Daylighters. And um, which thrills me because it was my title. Yay! Uh, and I have a young adult project that's coming out in 2014 called Prince of Shadows, which is very, very different. It's a retelling of Romeo and Juliet from in the period from the point of view of Benvolio, Romeo's cousin. Uh, because he's in the play all over the place, and he has he's always the guy that's trying to stop Romeo from doing crazy things. And I thought, wow, he must be an interesting guy on looking all of this nonsense. And uh, it, it turned out to be quite an interesting project. And um, basically everything you think you know about Romeo and Juliet is wrong. So, but the events of the play are all still there. <laughs> That's really good. Can I, can I ask the, the evil question, the evil spoilery question? I don't know, can you? Will it have a happy ending? <laughs> It's Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> but it's a different character's point of view, so perhaps. Um, I can't answer for Romeo and Juliet. They're kind of, you know, already. <laughs> I, I, I can't exactly say, and it was all a dream. <laughs> so I don't know about that one. But um, I, I will say it, I think it has a very satisfying ending. How's that? That sounds good. Okay. Yeah. So, so you've got two more Morganville books, you've mm-hmm. got this Romeo and Juliet mm-hmm. retelling. Right. Is there anything else? Uh, right now I don't have any, well, uh, sorry, I lied. There's the third revivalist book, which is called Terminated, and it's going to be out August-ish next year. Um, and uh, that will complete the adult, the, that cycle of that adult series. Um, I currently have a lot of stuff that's sort of in the hopper for young adult and adult, but I haven't gotten it brought to the market yet because I'm, <laughs> I've been so busy. Uh, so that's what next year is for, is to start putting together new projects. All right. Well, it'll be really interesting to follow what you're doing. Thank you. 
Well, I appreciate you coming and uh, talking to me today. Thank That's you great. very much for talking to us. Thank you.